I'd like to begin my discussion of Zora Neale Hurston with a bit of criticism that she received. Richard Wright famously uh, wrote a scathing uh, review and critique of Hurston's novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God. Uh, and to quote Richard Wright, Miss Hurston voluntarily continues in her novel the tradition which was forced upon the Negro in the theater. That is, the minstrel technique that makes the white folks laugh. And Wright went on to say, The sensory sweep of her novel carries no theme, no message, no thought. In the main, her novel is not addressed to the Negro, but to a white audience whose chauvinistic tastes she knew how to satisfy. Excuse me, she knows how to satisfy. <clears throat> and this represents a huge rift in the community of African American writers. Now, of course, Richard Wright is famous for his novel Native Son and his autobiography Black Boy, um, in which he really delves into race, racism, um, politics, and social issues regarding uh, the treatment of African Americans. Uh, so for him to say that Hurston is putting on a minstrel show for the benefit of white readers um, is a huge attack and I think for many decades, Hurston's legacy was unable to recover from this. Uh, Hurston did uh, respond by saying that Richard Wright's dialogue read as if he were tone deaf. Um, and in part, this is an aesthetic um, disagreement between these two writers. Um, and for Richard Wright, he believes that the purpose of the story is to convey a political message and a social message. Uh, whereas Hurston's uh, main purpose as an artist uh, is to explore sort of human situations and interactions between people. Right? Now, Hurston's dialogue uh, really was written from the perspective of someone who was a trained anthropologist. Hurston studied at Howard University and later at Barnard in New York City, where she was the only African-American student, and she went on to study at Columbia. Um, and as part of her research, she documented uh, the speech patterns of rural African-Americans from the South. And of course, she was uh, from the South herself. Um, and really, she pioneered this technique of using dialect in her writing. And if you notice, the dialogue reads uh, in dialect as the characters would have spoken the words, and the narration itself is written in what we might call, in quotation marks, standard English. Um, and that was completely authentic. Uh, it was a stylistic choice that she made, and she absolutely wanted to represent the people and their situations as they existed, uh, rather than conveying a political message. Okay. Um, another reason Hurston was attacked by many critics is that the novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God, and most of her other works, including the short story Sweat, take place in a town that is 100% African American. And this is the town of Eatonville, Florida. Uh, and in actuality, this was one of the first all-black towns uh, that was officially recognized and incorporated into a U.S. state. And many readers and many critics um, were extremely skeptical of this depiction of this town that had an African-American mayor, African-American police force, every individual in the community uh, was black. Um, and it's interesting to note that Richard Wright himself uh, fled racism in the South, uh, but he read her works as completely unrealistic. Historians now know not only was her work realistic, um, in terms of social science it was pretty much revolutionary uh, to use fiction to convey these speech patterns and these uh, situations. Um, so the majority of uh, Hurston's characters are rural, uh, African-American, working class, Southerners, uh, with very little education. And she's writing primarily in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, so this is during Jim Crow era, uh, during segregation. 
for example. Uh, however, you might have noticed that her works don't seem to focus primarily on race or racism. And in fact, she has this famous quote in her essay, How It Feels to Be Colored Me. Uh, to quote Hurston, I am not tragically colored. There is no great sorrow damned up in my soul, nor lurking behind my eyes. I do not mind at all. I do not belong to the sobbing school of Negrohood, who hold that nature somehow has given them a low-down dirty deal, and whose feelings are all hurt about it. Even the helter-skelter skirmish that is my life, I have seen that the world is to the strong, regardless of a little pigmentation, more or less. No, I do not weep at the world. I am too busy sharpening my oyster knife. End quote. And that last line is a reference to the phrase, uh, the world is your oyster, meaning you can have anything you want. Uh, so she is sharpening her oyster knife in preparation uh, for having anything she wants, regardless of race, as she says, regardless of a little pigmentation, more or less. And to some degree, I think this is uh, the result of her having grown up in a town that, as I mentioned, was 100% African-American, so that her primary concern is the interactions between people, not necessarily between a state or a society uh, and the individual. Um, one of the larger themes in her work, in her work, is gender. Um, and we have uh, male characters who objectify women and talk down to women and for the most part these are african-american male characters uh, speaking about african-american female characters and of course the obvious example is the short story sweat uh, in sweat we have this character sykes uh, who calls delia uh, uh, his wife a hypocrite right at the beginning i think we set up this idea Right, that he's calling her a hypocrite, and we see as the story goes on uh, that he's being unfaithful to her, uh, that he's not supportive financially or emotionally, and in fact he's abusive, physically abusive, as well as psychologically damaging, damaging uh, in the way that he speaks to her. So we have um, an imbalance of power uh, that is based on gender that's really at the heart of this story. Um, Delia, the character, is portrayed as hardworking. Um, she has put up with this abuse. She knows about Bertha, Sykes' lover, uh, but she sort of endures. And by the end, uh, she transitions from being a female char character with little or no power uh, to becoming empowered. And I think this is why a lot of modern readers uh, look at Hurston's work and say, oh, she is a feminist writer. More on that uh, in a moment. Um, also, if we look at uh, Delia, uh, we can see that there's a lot of religious imagery. Uh, and Delia pretty much is a Jesus figure uh, within this short story. Uh, in fact, I'll read a quote. Delia's work-worn knees crawled over the earth in Gethsemane and up the rocks of Calvary many, many times during these months. She avoided the villagers and meeting places in her efforts to be blind and deaf. And there are some biblical references here in this quote. Uh, of course, the concept that the blind and deaf can be uh, healed, metaphorically. Um, and also the references to Gethsemane and Calvary. Uh, Gethsemane is the place where Jesus prayed and wept uh, before his crucifixion. And the concept is that it's a place of suffering, it's a place of toil, and in a story that is called Sweat, and in which Delia claims that sweat is all she has, uh, it's important to note that Gethsemane is the place where Jesus sweat blood. Uh, Calvary would be the place where Jesus was crucified. So the imagery uh, sort of sets up Delia as a Jesus figure, uh, which I think would have been natural or consistent for Hurston, uh, given that her own grandfather uh, was a Baptist preacher, and that she really assumes that her readers are familiar with Christian terminology and Christian imagery. Um, the other 
a very clear example, I think, is the snake imagery. And we have Sykes um, associated with the snake, who in Genesis uh, sort of causes original sin. Um, and I think even Sykes' name is meant to be reminiscent um, of a snake, or the sound that a snake makes. Um, and keeping with this uh, sort of biblical tone and biblical imagery, uh, we can look at monkey junk, uh, which does a great job, I think, of conveying what's known as, what's considered to be mock biblical language. Um, readers who are familiar with the King James Version of the Bible understand, uh, you know, even these words like yea, uh, Y-E-A, right? Um, and a lot of the language is meant to be an allusion to the Bible. Um, and I think one of the ironies here is that it's a story that focuses on divorce. And it's meant to show a sort of change in the modern world as Hurston sees it um, from what many consider to be a sort of traditional values. Not that the stories in the Bible are necessarily wholesome or free of uh, conflict, um, but I think it's her way of making a commentary on sort of modern, modern life. So we see biblical language mixed in with Harlem slang. And again, Hurston is very focused on language and the way she presents her stories in a stylistic way. Um, so I'll just read an example. This is from line 26. Then answered she with a great sassiness of tongue, Neither shalt not deny me thy shekels, for I shall seek them in law. Yea, shall I lift up my voice, and the lawyers and judges shall hear my plea, and thou shalt pay dearly. For verily, they permit no turpitudinous mama to suffer. Selah and Amen. Um, and of course, we have biblical references. The shekels would be the currency of Israel, um, as seen in the Bible. Uh, you know, this line, I shall lift up my voice, and the judges shall hear my plea. Uh, very reminiscent of the Old Testament and the uh, explanation of the judges. But of course, she's talking about a modern court. She's talking about divorce court. <laughs> and so, uh, it sort of has this modern spin on it. And it is sprinkled with a sort of uh, Harlem slang, right? They shall permit no turpitudinous mama to suffer. Um, and when it comes to gender in Monkey Junk, I think this is where Hurston's legacy uh, as a writer and as a supposed feminist gets very interesting. And yes, in Their Eyes Were Watching God and Sweat, uh, we have stories of empowerment for women that otherwise would not have been empowered and who started off in their stories uh, with an extreme lack of power. <clears throat> But in Monkey Junk, our female character, who is not named, um, is manipulative. I mean, she writes a female character uh, who essentially tricks this man uh, into marrying her. Um, we see that she is described as a flirt, uh, which I think uh, insinuates that she is unfaithful. And she uses her sexuality and her sexual appeal uh, to gain her favor in the court and to win her trial and thereby uh, gain alimony aplenty, uh, which means all his jack, another uh, sort of instance of slang there, all his jack, all his money. Um, so how can we explain uh, this sort of seeming contradiction in Hurston's ideals? I mean, first of all, uh, Hurston and probably no other writer is that simplistic uh, that we can say all female writers would go from unempowered to empowered, for example. <clears throat> But I think it's also um, a part of the setting. Uh, you know, Hurston, as I mentioned, came from Florida, from the South, from a town that was 100% African American. But she eventually left, and she had lived in Harlem. Uh, she lived in Haiti. She lived in Belize. Um, she lived in mm, these places that are known for being majority uh, African American. And this is part of the Great Migration. Um, so we have characters um, who are from these rural settings, but they are living in this urban, sort of modernized, uh, northern setting. And I think the main male character, who is also not named, uh, is a little out of his element here. 
right? And that line at the end, that he went back to Alabama to pick cotton, right? It's a reference to sharecropping at the time, um, which some called the modern version of slavery. Uh, it's a reference to the rural society that he had left, and I think to the idea that you know, you can't make it in the big city if you don't understand uh, that the rules here are very different and that life for African Americans and anyone else who had left those rural settings uh, is very different now. Um, by the way, that ending with the uh, line of uh, go to the monkeys, uh, I think is a subtle reference to race. Notice that the female character is called a brown, uh, which would mean that she's an African-American with light skin, and that the male character likely uh, has darker skin than she has. Um, so, you know, in one way I read the title as, you know, monkey junk means monkeying around, um, not taking things seriously, and I think this male character is in Harlem, you know, he's very arrogant, he he claims that he understands women, that he understands the laws and the prophets. Obviously, he does not understand the laws, um, and I think profit is a pun there. Uh, he understands profit in terms of money more than he understands uh, the spiritual prophets. So he's sort of monkeying around. Uh, but also, I think it's a pun, and it has to do with this issue of uh, sort of split within African Americans and this happens among many other communities, uh, based on skin tone. Um, so many uh, modern readers like to claim Hurston as a sort of vanguard of the feminist movement, and many conservatives try to claim Hurston as one of their own uh, because she does not write a lot about racism and race. Um, and the fact is, Hurston herself was writing before these distinctions and before these claims, and never commented directly on them. Um, so I guess she's sort of, her legacy can be easily adapted by these sort of uh, conflicting uh, factions in the literary community. Uh, but overall, I think it's important to note that her legacy continues uh, because of the feminist movement and because of feminist writers who reclaimed her work um, I think Richard Wright would have been happy to allow her work to uh, just sort of um, fade into obscurity. Uh, but we have this famous essay by Alice Walker called Looking for Zora. Uh, Alice Walker is the author of The Color Purple. Um, and really she was looking to Hurston as a sort of literary and artistic ancestor uh, and pioneer. Uh, who would write from the African-American women's perspective. And I think when you uh, gain no notoriety um, with someone like Alice Walker and also Toni Morrison, the author of Beloved and about seven of my other favorite books, and Ralph Ellison, uh, then we can say that her legacy deserves to endure and that the famous Richard Wright was wrong on this one.